wanted to start with uh, Minister Iswara, and uh, you know, Singapore ranked top in the 20 smart cities. I'm wondering how technology is reshaping a city like Singapore, with, which doesn't really have resources except its people. Well, that's probably the answer is in your question. I think it's precisely because we are a very resource-constrained place that we rely a lot on technology and innovation to be able to punch above our weight. And I think when you talk about smart nation, it's a very big word, a big phrase. You have to unpack it. And unpacking means, on the one hand, what governments can do, using technologies to provide better services to citizens. And that's a major part of our work. And on the other side is what we can do with the private sector to ensure that technology is being used to enhance the productivity and, and innovation capacity of our companies. And then the last piece, which perhaps doesn't always get as much attention as it should, is the consequences for society. And I think you need an important stream of work in that area in any country to ensure that there is confidence and trust in the technology so that the technology can then be used for the purposes that it's intended. A lot to unpack there, and I'll pick up some of the points that you mentioned. But first of all, what technology trends are shaping Singapore's smart city goals and agenda? Well, I think it's a very wide area, but I'll just highlight a couple. One is 5G. Um, obviously, 5G is going to be a key part of our digital infrastructure going forward. And we've just launched a call for proposals, and our intent is to have a stand two standalone 5G networks in Singapore uh, by the middle of, you know, by 2025 and probably earlier. And then the second part is really around AI, artificial intelligence. It's a very broad area, but one of the things we've been working on is application oriented. Uh, in other words, we have this initiative called AI.SG, where we bring industry and academia together to work on problem statements, so there's a practical bend to it, and at the same time train AI talent. And that's just an example. On the government side, we're putting out these grand challenges for AI, looking at sectors like healthcare, financial services, transportation, municipal services, and that's the other area. So just a couple of things to highlight how we're going about it. Bore, perhaps you can highlight, I mean, how do you get the foundations right for a smart economy, a smart city? I, 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 of course, representing Ericsson and, and thinking about the network, I think the foundation for almost all the innovation that can go into a smart city will lie in its connectivity. So having ubiquitous connectivity is going to be critical. So that's why I'm happy to hear and knowing that from, from the, our customers as well, the plans to build out 5G networks in, in a city like Singapore. Because when you start to get connectivity, then you can collect the data, you can process the data, and you can be smart in your algorithm. Because ultimately, a, a smart city is about utilizing a scarce resource more effectively. Whether that is the climate or if it's kind of physical assets, uh, depends on, but it requires connectivity. Peter? Yeah, I think <coughs> smart cities for us means smart buildings where you actually have en energy efficient buildings, uh, where you use all the technologies to then do the second one, which is smart power. So you include um, renewables, you include uh, microgrids, uh, nanogrids, etc. You have smart transport, where you include electric vehicles, and that's not just cars, that's buses, that's trucks, that's trains. Um, and, and the last one, you need smart industry. And that's where then the link also to 5G comes to Ericsson. Uh, because if you have smart industries, you, if you digitalize um, uh, the installations of our customers by using 5G, by using the data, getting smarter each time, you move from manufacturing of today to automation and then to autonomous manufacturing. That's how we can build an environment um, in, a, in a city like, like Singapore. And a lot of these elements we are, we are actually exploring and building in Singapore. That's how you can bring the cities uh, forward because the world will urbanize much more in the future and 75% of the global CO2 is produced today in the cities mm -hmm. and we need to tackle this one. How is it playing out in India? I think um, overall if you take uh, uh, technology adoption, I think in India it has been a significant adoption of technology. Uh, I'll come to 5G in a minute. 
but uh, to, to my mind, um, AI, machine learning, IoT, cloud, I think that bus is left. I think uh, everybody has to adopt, whether you are in um, uh, public services delivery or in terms of industrial companies. Um, at the Tata Group level, I, we take all of this uh, in multiple dimensions. Luckily, we have uh, companies which are providing these services, and also we have companies which adopt these services. So uh, in India, it has to be thought slightly differently, because in fact, I've written a book on this called Digital Nation. Uh, to our mind, uh, AI, machine learning, um, will be the fundamental tools um, in transforming India, because India's problems are two kinds. One is the lack of access, whether it is healthcare, whether it is education, whether it is judiciary, whether it is infrastructure. And especially if you go to the rural areas, the access level is very poor. We have one of the worst ratios in terms of um, doctor patients. And you can give the statistics in a number of industries. On the other side, we have a million people coming to the workforce every month. We need to find jobs. And uh, by deliberately deploying technology in a way that you kind of give the AI tools to common people and not it is for the elite people and AI is not only for software engineers. How AI and machine learning and other digital tools can be available to but, common but people. But how realistic is that goal? Well, how do you help? Realistic. It's pretty realistic because we have done some pilots and we did a pilot um, in healthcare outside Bangalore um, in a small uh, district called Kolar where we have 1.5 million, 1 million people and we were able to dramatically change the delivery of primary, primary health care um, in that pilot. So similarly, we have done three, four other locations as well. It's not as complicated. We think it's very complicated. It's not, <laughs> te technology is not very complicated. To my mind, teaching digital skills to kids is much easier than teaching them reading, writing, and, and, and counting. So we, we, we have to remove this myth around technology. Now coming to... Um, Overall technology, I think it, it includes the whole thing. You can't separate uh, whether it is AI, whether it is uh, machine learning. None of this is operable um, efficiently on their own. Whether it's AI, AI, for AI to work, you need data. So you have to be a you have to, you have to be a data rich company. You have to be a data rich nation, and which essentially means you've got to address data privacy issues. You've got to uh, uh, address cyber security issues, data issues. And then you got to build the digital infrastructure so the data can travel. If it's in a, uh, f you can take the 5G either as a city or a nation or as a factory. So in a closed ecosystem, wherever you're up applying this network, um, whether it's a 4G network or a 5G network, um, the impact will be felt. Today, the, the, the application of uh, 4G is clear. The application of 5G, we can talk about that later on, is evolving. I'll pick up on that. I want to bring Pierre into the discussion, mobility, transportation, one of the biggest challenges as we move into uh, the future. Uh, do you see an extinction of a transportation ecosystem as we know it? How do you see that playing out? Yeah, very, very much so. I think the, uh, the, transport e the transportation ecosystem as we know it is very much reliant on individual ownership. If you look around cities, you see cars everywhere, and those cars are being parked most of the day. And we believe at Uber that uh, over time, we're going to see a shift from uh, this individual car ownership era to one whereby people can access safe, reliable transportation, affordable, hopefully, transportation at the tap of a button. And this is really the transformation that we are uh, trying to play a role into. And that means that um, you will start to see uh, mobility platforms that aggregate a bunch of the transport options that exist across cities. Public transit is going to remain a key part of that of the transit eco of the transport ecosystem, just because of the the efficiency and the scale it brings. But next to that, you will have a lot more efficient first mile, last mile options. For instance, we're starting to see the emergence of bike sharing, scooter sharing schemes. We think this is going to continue. Uh, so this is this is one pillar, really, the move away from individual co-ownership, and that will help from an envir environmental standpoint. We also think that you're going to see a huge electrification of the cities. Today, if you, if, you, if you look at cities, most of the transport grid is still very much reliant 
on fuel combustion engine, and this is going to change. Um, and finally, I I'd say the, the last pillar is really one of uh, autonomous. Uh, as, you, as you might know, Uber has been investing for, for many years now into autonomous technology, self-driving technology. And we think that those are going to be pretty much uh, critical to this transformation that cities are going through because not only are, going, are they going to uh, very much improve road safety, the majority of car accidents are actually driven by human errors, uh, but they're also going to accelerate this transition away from individual car ownership because the technology is going to be very expensive uh, for many people to actually afford. And it's also going to make less and less sense for people to buy that asset themselves when they can access it at, at such a simple, in such a simple way using their, using their smartphone. So this is really where we see um, cities headed in the future. I'd, I'd say the, lo the last part, which I'm often getting asked about, is kind of that third dimension that exists. Today, the transport ecosystem happens in, in two dimensions. Um, and we, we kind of believe that just like many cities around the world moved over time from two dimension to kind of skyscrapers and really using that, that vertical dimension, we think the same might actually happen um, in the field of transportation. Um, the, the battery technology has radically evolved over the past few years, which means that batteries now have enough density to carry their own weight, which is why you're seeing all those new, uh, all those new vehicles starting to emerge, those vertical takeoff landing vehicles, as, as you know, and we think they can play an important role in this, in this whole grid. That's the goal, that's the vision. We talk about flying taxis, autonomous cars. I mean, Minister, in a country like Singapore, where, where, where having a car is, well, the perception is a must. I mean, do you see the city headed in that direction? How soon can that happen? The same thing in India. Minister first, please. Well, I think that's why we encourage public transport. And I think our modal split now is about s nearly 70-30. And I think people see the value of uh, moving away from personal vehicles to shared solutions, whether it's public transport or other modalities. But I think the key point I want to make would be, and I think whether you're a business or a government, it's not about pursuing technology for the sake of technology. It must be solving a problem and creating value in some way, whether it is better service to citizens or uh, in terms of better profitability or lower costs, whatever. So I'd say, for example, with 5G and how we're going about it, it's not just about coming up with the infrastructure and that looks like a trophy asset. But it's actually about the use cases that will utilize the capabilities of 5G. So we have a parallel effort working with industry and uh, carriers on use case models. So PSA is working with a couple of our carriers. The, port, the airport is working with some. Uh, Razor is working on consumer applications, you know, and gaming solutions and so on with one of our carriers and so on. So the key point I wanted to make was, I think the technology solutions and, and transportation is another example. Uh, this is an important area. And just to pick up a point that was made earlier, I think the data side is also critical. And we talk, tend to talk about data as if it's one monolithic mass. And yet there's a whole spectrum of data from that which is generated by machines and sensors right through to very personalized data. And if you take a one-size-fits-all approach in regulation, in cross-border treatment, is going to stymie the possibilities. We need more nuanced thinking on this. I think uh, when you... you, you and, and Tata's testing uh, robo-taxis. Yeah, we're testing robo-taxis. But let's, uh, let me uh, uh, just step back and talk, uh, talk about this question that you asked from the Indian context. I think the question to ask is not whether India will build a 5G network or how fast the flying taxis will be a reality in India. Again, I completely endorse the point it, that technology for the sake of technology is not good. So let's step back and understand India. In India, anything that's implement, to be implemented requires a massive scale implementation. It is not a small thing. It's not a small project. And have we got the credibility to that? There are some terrific implementations we have done. Even a think like the identity card, unique identity card or, that, or our payment architecture that the whole country now has, are providing access online to a direct account to every citizen in the country. These are 
if you if you consider the complexity of the country, the size of the country, the population, and the demography, and the rural urban divide, and the uh, uh, poor rich divide, and the educated uneducated divide, I mean it is all massive transformation. So we can pull off large scale transformations, but what are the large scale transformations we need to do? So we have got to start with that objective. So we need to. Technology in India is very different from technology in Singapore or America because technology in very advanced countries is to drive efficiency. What are you trying to do? You are doing it this good, you are do, want to doing it even better. But in India, technology has to be used first to create access. There you are trying to make the market efficient. Here you are trying to create the market. Okay, the objective of use of the technology is very different in India. Okay, that has to be, so efficiency comes much later. We are not so much worried about efficiency. We're first worried, worried about creating the market and providing the access so everybody can participate in the digital economy. So what are the things that we have to do? We definitely have to solve our pollution problem, which essentially means the question to ask is whether, whether EV will take off in India. EV has to take off in India. We don't, we don't know, we, we have no choice left. 14 out of the 15 cities in, in the world, most polluted cities are in India. Okay, and we can give so many other statistics. And the passenger car market will grow. It's a 3 million vehicle and it will go to 10 million and more and so on and so forth. So we had to create the necessary infrastructure. Is flying taxis a necessity? Answer is no. But if it is going to be a solution that's going to somehow disrupt everything else and and and, and going to be a very unique value proposition, it'll get adopted. Market will decide. But mass transport is very important, and transport that is sustainable is very important. Similarly, if you take healthcare, how can we apply technologies to solve the healthcare problem? How can we apply technology to give uniform access to education? 5G has a good context, because with 5G, the, the experience that you can create in education with the high quality, uh, video, virtual reality, and so on and so forth. And similarly, the treatment you can give remotely for healthcare, how it can be embedded with all the other things we talk about in terms of providing a great primary healthcare is just stupendous. So there is a case. So it will get, technology will get adopted in solving these kind of problems, and we have many of them to solve. So if you start looking at whether India has adopted technology in full, it will always be whether the glass is half full or half empty because we've got so many things to do. But I think we will one by one implement. Similarly, in the power sector, we have got to go renewables. So we don't have to create big power plants. So in fact, we are doing a, we are doing a project, which is a microgrid power plant, which is for a small village with 400 households. We have executed it successfully, it works, and we have partnered with Rockefeller Foundation from a funding point of view. We think if we can get it a little bit more attractive financially, which within, which we think is, is in our reach, this can be taken to 10,000 villages. This will be not only applicable to Indian villages, it can be applicable to any other emerging markets, and totally renewables. So we have to make this transition from, uh, so it will not be only solar and wind in large scale. So we've got to look at other forms of solutions. And these innovations will happen in India, not elsewhere. Bori, let's become on the transition. I mean, as far as er Ericsson's concerned, I mean, the estimates is that IoT, 22 what, billion gadgets by 2024. How will, that, what, how will that play out in terms of how we work, how we play, how we interact? You know, there, it's, it's sometimes worth to think back uh, 10, 12 years when we launched 4G networks. Then, then we had a lot of debate uh, you know, with, with our customers. What's the use case of 4G? Today, we take it for granted, right? No one thought at that time about Uber, for example. That was a completely unknown concept. Mm. We didn't know that we would stream TV shows on the cell phone. We didn't know that 90% of all transactions done in the financial sector would be done on the cell phone. No one thought about those things. But, but what, it, what it did once the platform was available, and the platform was first built out in, in the US, uh, so Verizon launched uh, the first 4G network, followed by China. And what two countries dominate the app economy? 
is actually the US and China. Mm. So I think sometimes we, we forget that, that the network and the connectivity is a platform for innovation. So when we think now about the future, the only thing we can know is that we will be completely wrong <laughs> in the way we predict uh, how it will be used. Uh, because if we would know it, we would already have started that as a side business running that to make money <laughs> on, right? Uh, so so the, the key here is to get the platform built out. Then we can, on top of that, create new applications. And there I think, for example, we're going to see sensors used much more. So today, you know, the biggest cost of, of putting out the sensor is actually the connectivity, the wire pulling or if you need a really reliable sensor. That's going to change in a wireless world. Then you can put many more sensors out, you can read new data, you can collect data points, you can start to you know, think about the city. You put in sensors, even if we don't change the traffic pattern, we can put in sensors to determine the traffic real time. And when there is an emergency, some patients maybe have a cardiac arrest, for example you can create a free path of traffic for that ambulance. That's going to save human lives and human suffering. But there are going to be many of these applications for all the connected devices. We talk about 22 billion. But we don't really know exactly how it's going to be used. But we do believe you need to build this platform very quickly in order to participate in the future. Peter, for ABB, where do you see the most exciting innovation, the, the biggest opportunities? Yeah, I think what we have heard so far, we have talked a lot about what I call the B2C angle. Mm -hmm. Now, what has still to start in a bigger way is what then I say is the B2B one. So the digitalization of industries, um, so that transformation has, in my opinion, only started. It will be helped by connectivity. Uh, it will be he helped by all devices having a sensor and then actually using those data in order to then get more efficient, more productivity out. Uh, quite clearly, we have a world ahead of us which will have uh, lower growth. Therefore, productivity is becoming more and more, and more Im uh, important. So that's one big area where ABB is clearly on the automation side, um, but it is also going towards autonomous um, uh, manufacturing, where manufacturing uh, places will manage themselves in that sense. So that's one big direction. And then the other big direction is clearly, and we heard this already, uh, we will see a revolution on, in terms of uh, the e-mobility side. Now, let me also be clear, because we all think that will happen between today and tomorrow, and that's <laughs> not going to happen. So we will have a hybrid of solutions for quite a long time. And uh, also fossil fuels will play a certain role for um, years and decades still to come. But the electric vehicle or hydrogen vehicles, uh, they will clearly grow very fast. So it is up to us now uh, to A, build on the one side the infrastructure of power that we can actually have smart cities, for example, uh, to have an electri electricity mobility. Because today, if I take six superchargers somewhere in a city, uh, and I actually put them all on, most probably the four or five square miles around it, they will have no power. So with that, again, that needs investments, that needs infrastructure. But then, yes, we go down, so the, the buses are the next ones, the trucks are the next uh, uh, ones, because that's where I think the technology is needed. Uh, we see the purpose there, and therefore we can also build um, uh, an ecosystem uh, working together with the OEMs, with the governments, with the power producers, with ourselves. And this it gives us the, the great opportunities. The whole robotization in, in various forms, we heard already twice the health sector. We have just started the biz um, uh, business proposition now with the biggest hospital in the world, where we are in the lab. We are using now our robots. These are moving robots together with um, lab uh, staff uh, to actually help us to increase also the, 
uh, the probability of getting things right the first time. And uh, we are developing all these uh, type of um, applications and that's a, a, a great uh, growth uh, area for us in the future. But it's all based on data, it's all based on connectivity, on sensors, etc. Pierre, that switch to e-mobility eventually, uh, should there be incentives, disincentives, which would be helpful? So first of all, I, I very much agree with the, the point you, you were just making on, on the importance of an ecosystem. Uh, I think this is especially the case with e-mobility, where no single player can do that alone, and you actually need a whole ecosystem, including the infrastructure uh, side of things. Um, I do think that uh, cities play an important role in creating that incentive. Uh, we have worked very closely in London, for instance, with the city uh, and made important commitments to transition on our entire fleet to electric by 2025. Um, and this has been made possible by, frankly, first of all, a hard stance that the city has taken in terms of uh, ultra low emission zones, in terms of uh, taxing some of the most polluting cars, uh, making it harder for those cars to access the city center. A lot of those things you know, we think are fundamentally good because they're the right way to create uh, enough of a push within the private sectors for people to actually lean in, which is, which is kind of what, what we've done in London and what we were looking to, uh, to replicate elsewhere in, um, you know, across, across, across the world. Uh, on, the, on the topic of, um, of, um, of self-driving, uh, I know we chatted a bit about how that's going to take time. Also, I agree with, with that point. Our, our view at Uber is that uh, there is going to be a pretty uh, long transition to a world that is fully autonomous. And we think that... What is that long transition? How many years are we looking at? Well, to be candid, I think no one really knows. If you uh, had to put a figure to it? I I it's, just, it's just very difficult to know. And um, th th there's a big gap. Like, it's a pretty... Uh, it's an asymptote, which means that uh, it's easy to make some of the early improvements. And as you continue to build the technology to make sure that the car can operate here in Davos when it's snowing and when there's a lot of traffic, it gets exponentially difficult. And that's why it's so hard to, to put an exact timeline on when the technology will be ready uh, for full you know, commercialization and rollout. Now, we're quite convinced that um, we will be able in, in the near future, and I'm talking you know, probably years, um, uh, to start and have uh, on specific routes, under specific conditions, uh, fully autonomous cars driving on roads of cities around the world. Uh, as far as Uber is concerned, we feel that um, we have an important role to play when it comes to the commercialization strategy of those technology because we'll be able to uh, start and integrate self-driving cars within the fleet of drivers we have, which means that when you uh, order an Uber, depending on where you go, depending on the weather, on whether we have actually mapped this specific corner, we'll dispatch you either a self-driving car or a traditional car. And this is really how we see the technology emerging over time and starting to take a bigger and bigger share of the cities. I want to bring uh, Minister Zwar into the conversation because Singapore is already testing autonomous cars. What's your take and what have been the challenges? Well, I think uh, we don't want to prejudge the evolution of the technology. I think whether it is autonomous, semi-autonomous, uh, I think as has been described, it's uh, path dependent. And I think many factors come into play. Technology is only one aspect of it. We've talked quite a bit about infrastructure and we talk about physical infrastructure mm -hmm. like uh, 5G and so on. But I think a key point in this is the regulatory and digital infrastructure that supports it. Uh, if I take an example from a completely different area, trade, if you think about cross-border trade and the amount of documentation that goes into cross-border trade, uh, I was told today that you know, there are 40, 50 points sometimes when trans uh, moving from one place to another. And yet we have not digitized it. It is a highly inefficient area. So what does it require? It's not just physical infrastructure because we've got that in spades. You need the digital infrastructure, a platform that can link up and so they, whether it's using blockchain, et cetera, to create the trust in the transaction. And then you need the regulatory infrastructure that will recognize and support it. So like today, we launched uh, an effort. Uh, we've got this initiative called Trade Trust in Singapore. And that's exactly what it is, to have trust in digital trade. And we're working with uh, partners like PSA, like various banks and so on, and, and trading companies like Trafigura and so on. 
in order to precisely create the environment that can ride on digital infrastructure with regulatory support to create that kind of efficiency gains at the systemic level. And I think with transportation, I think it's the same. It's not just about running ahead with the technology and autonomous vehicles. It has to be fit for purpose in the context of the country, the city, the place. And then the regulators have to respond to that, and the infrastructure must be able to support it, the physical infrastructure. So I think it's something, it's a tandem play, and we need to be working in a coordinated manner. And that's where the partnership between the public and private sector is key to realize a lot of the value propositions in this sort of digital evolutions that we're talking about. Before we talk about the private and uh, public sector cooperation, I just want to touch on 5G first. I mean, we talk about how okay. it's inevitable. But given this US-China spat and the pressure that Huawei's uh, getting, do you see a delay at all in the rollout, Chandra? I think uh, if you ask about India, um, the 5G rollout has um, uh, many implications. First of all, um, it's a, another huge capital investment. The private players have to uh, find it viable in a given time frame, so it will get rolled out as they feel that it is viable to do it. Second thing, as much as I fully agree that uh, my apologies. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that... Uh, not because of your question, <laughs> but I do have to go somewhere. <laughs> Minister Iswar has Thank to you. leave um, yeah. because he has an appointment. My apologies. If you could uh, give him a round of Thank applause. You Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. So the... Please. Yeah, the, uh, one is the uh, capital investment that's required. The second one is also the fact that the 5G applications have to be thought through. Um, I, I think it will evolve. Um, now, 4G is very clear because uh, in, in 4G, everyone at one point in time recognized that the data usage is going to be so huge and that will uh, make the business model very viable. In the case of 5G, uh, you got to look at it at two different levels. One is at uh, industrial companies. For example, how do you create a 5G environment in a company where all the devices can connect, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of IoT sensors deployment already happening today. Uh, even if our own company, Tata Communications, if you take, Tata Communications has uh, you know, put in a huge uh, IoT network in 40 cities across India. Um, and many of our uh, service companies also working towards upgrading the legacy infrastructure to 5G infrastructure. So. Uh, the application in the industrial space I, will become very clearer with rather more easily because these devices will get connected, the, datas, the, the, the data richness uh, will allow these companies to uh, draw insights and take decisions and so on and so forth. But when it comes to B2C, it will take longer. Uh, so I think it's uh, directionally that's where uh, it will go but it's not going to happen like that. Not tomorrow. <laughs> not tomorrow. Bar Bari, the rollout in Asia, the US versus Europe. Yeah, it's um, the US led the development. So the US was the first to launch really commercial 5G service um, with our equipment. So we're happy about that, of course. But, but uh, uh, that was launched early on. Uh, the US suffers, though, from a couple of problems that will make it tougher to roll out. They don't have the mid-band frequencies really available, so they lack spectrum, which we never really talk about, and it's kind of almost a technical issue. But when you build infrastructure, especially wireless networks, it's the key uh, restriction in a way. If you don't have spectrum, no cellular connectivity. So the spectrum is, is a problem in the US. Uh, otherwise, the US is racing ahead. We are going to see uh, deployments in the U.S., in city centers. We're starting to see connected factories, etc. Uh, we're building our own factory uh, in, uh, in Texas uh, with, that will supply 5G gear for the North American market using robots from ABB, so it's a tight partnership. Um, but there we're leveraging all the connectivity you can have. And, and what we see is massive efficiency gains in the pro production. 
So labor content is just now not the consideration. We make that up on saving on transportation costs. But then if you look at the rest of the world, Asia clearly has a very, and we're talking about Korea, Japan, China, very clear strategies to establish a leadership position in, in 5G. Korea made decisions already in 2014 to say that we are going to lead in 5G. So they were also clearly very early on launching networks. China is ramping up quickly. Uh, so China has probably about 150,000 sites, which is about a fourth of what is available in Europe in total in 4G. So China is ramping very, very quickly. Europe, with the exception of Switzerland, uh, Switzerland has a 5G network and you can I would even say that today, you know, the 4G network here in Davos is kind of congested, so it's a bit uh, low speed. So you should buy a 5G phone. Then you can have much better speed in the Congress Center because the 5G actually works there on commercial equipment, right? Something and, to and remember for next year. Yeah, but that's how, you know, can get it already this year. Uh, <laughs> if you get frustrated with 4G connectivity. Uh, but the reality is it's up and running here. So it, and, and, and there Swisscom is using, it's a 100% Ericsson customer. Uh, so we, of course, you know, are, are very happy about that. But the rest of Europe lags behind. Uh, and I think Europe will fall behind here um, unless some really important decisions are taken by the, uh, the regulators. And, and we don't really see that happening now. So it's rather likely that Europe would be to maybe two years behind as well. Uh, and that's going to have the same implications as being late on 4G. Peter. On what? This 5G and, 5G. you know, the spat between the US and China. Will that delay a rollout? And how do you, play, uh, how do you see this playing out? I think in the field of VR, where we have a very significant market share in China, and a very big business, we are confronted with the situation that we will have to most probably develop two different solutions. If you are serving in China 40, 50% of state-owned enterprises, I think over the next uh, years, one will need to deal with this issue. Uh, and hence, we need to be prepared to actually um, have uh, multiple op options available. Uh, in the rest of the world, it's our customers who will connect very fast, which will allow us obviously to bring the latest technology innovations in from robots to sensor to whatever automation process you can think about, but also smart homes, because we are connecting your entire home with electricity and all can be steered. For that, again, uh, we use 5G. Um, uh, but in China, quite clearly, uh, the bifurcation of technology, as we are seeing it at the moment, if that persists, uh, companies like ABB will have uh, no um, kind of uh, other solutions than most probably work with various players in this field rather than one. And if they, there could also be an emergence of different technologi technological standards over time, and that will give companies like ours um, a challenge. It will add costs. Uh, it will, uh, I wouldn't say it will slow things down, uh, but clearly we will have to deal with this issue. Can there be one standard in the end? I think uh, it, it's fair to say that they'll all be interoperable to some extent. It'll go towards interoperable solutions, but may not be one single standard with the way things are going. Um, but I think it'll evolve pretty rapidly. Can there be a single standard? I have to say that the success of the mobile industry relies on a single standard. Uh, that gives global scale for application developers, etc. So you can roll out globally anywhere and you can take your phone and go anywhere it works. I think that we have gotten so used to that, so I hope that is still going to be the model. But of course, what you see today, you can fear that, that different parts of the world could head different ways. But ultimately, I think logic will prevail and it will be, remain a global standard. Glass half full. Let's bring Pierre into the discussion. I mean, you know, we talk about how regulation has been very fragmented. From the mobility perspective, where are we headed and what is the danger of this fragmented regulation? 
So, so you're right, transport regulations tend to be extremely local, which means that even, even within a given country, you, you very often have regulations that are city dependent, uh, and, and that you know, just hasn't been necessarily super uh, convenient for, for companies and for global companies to, 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 to navigate. Um, I'd say at the end of the day, the, the most important or the most uh, def defining factor behind transport regulation tends to be safety. Um, and so uh, wh what's kind of really important to us is not so much whether we have the exact same regulation everywhere. I don't think that we're ever going to go to this place, but making sure that we're able to uh, share learnings as fast as possible across cities around the world, such that the best practices when it comes to safety get embraced as fast as possible elsewhere. And so we think certain cities around the world kind of leading, uh, frankly, leading the pack on, on that front. Some other cities actually uh, lagging, and, 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 and that's something that I think we as a, as a private company can can kind of help address by you know, connecting the dots and showing examples of where we've seen really compelling regulation from a safety standpoint. Is there a regulation that's setting you back, Well, the, the company? A lot of them, quite frankly. Such as? <laughs> um, well, in many countries, on, <laughs> in quite a few countries <laughs> around the world, um, what you see is that transport regulations that initially were designed with safety in mind have kind of evolved over decades to become a lot more about protecting an industry as opposed to uh, defending public interest, which means that a lot of countries have uh, restrictions such as what we call return to garage, like a lot of countries where when you order an Uber, the Uber comes pick you up, gets you wherever you want to go, but then has to get back to his garage before he's able to take another trip. This is something in today's world that makes absolutely no sense. The very um, obvious consequences when it comes to the environment, when it comes to the efficiency of the system, congestion, <laughs> price point for consumers, earnings for drivers. And yet, you'd be surprised how difficult it is at times to have those regulations change. Uh, now, what, what I would say is, broadly speaking, we've seen a huge uh, improvement over the past two years when it comes to um, to regulation when, you know, for, for our sector in particular, right, hailing. And many of the countries which had, you know, three, four, five years ago, a lot of those regs have actually moved past that and have embraced regulations that we think are very progressive, have safety first, and create a level playing field between all parties of the, uh, of the industry, which is really what we are about. Peter and Bori, you nodded quite vigorously when I asked about whether there were regulations that were setting <laughs> you back. Perhaps you can shed some light on your own um, perspective. No, I was more nodding because obviously <laughs> I know um, uh, the regulations which are standing <laughs> in the way for um, his disruptive business model to take, uh, uh, to take shape. But I think the, the more important point here is we are now moving ahead on what I called before the B2C side, where we have got data privacy regulations being embedded, especially in Europe. I think there is a, a huge need also to do the same on the industrial side. We need to start with this. And I think here again, I think uh, public-private partnership to drive these type of digital, um, um, let's say, regulations uh, for the industries, and it's all industries, is quite important because uh, it's clear that the technical revolutions which we are seeing, uh, it's no longer just on, on the mobile uh, side uh, or on the daily life side, it is also now coming into industry. I mean, we talk a lot about 5G, but I hear a lot about 6G already, which should be 1,000 times faster than 5G. Now, I don't know when this will come, but it's all of that will just develop faster and faster. And if we don't actually put a framework around that, which are acceptable or accepted uh, digital standards and uh, regulations, I think we will always run behind these things, and uh, that would uh, not be, um, let's say, the right thing. And I see a great chance here for Europe to lead on that side, similar to what they have done on the consumer side, and I hope that we can get, um, with the new commission, actually some progress here. Uh, John, do you see regulation keeping up well, with I think, innovation? Uh, uh, absolutely, regulations will be an important, um, I don't want to say stumbling block, important one that will uh, have to be taken into account when you're uh, uh, rolling out these things. Uh, some of it is necessary, for example, uh, data privacy, data localization. Uh, data residency, 
uh, who owns the data. Um, whenever you are talking about a global rollout, uh, crossing borders, these issues become even more, uh, even more pertinent. Uh, so there will be a lot of uh, uh, regulations that we have to comply with. The problem is in some of the areas, the regulation itself is evolving. Um, uh, it's, it's very difficult to answer in one line who owns the data. Um, so, so these things uh, definitely have to evolve as we, um, as we make progress in the rollout of these technologies. The, yeah, please. No, I was going to say, I, I think there are a lot of these questions that needs to be resolved. Take, for example, GDPR in Europe. Today, yeah. it actually covers machines as well. Yeah. So is machine data equally sensitive as personal, or is it more sensitive or less sensitive? We need to somehow discuss that. Another one of those regulations, net neutrality, for example. Net neutrality in a, in a 5G world where you can create ne network slices and dedicated networks. How should you think about that? Regulation today lags behind technology. And, and that's one of the issues. And it comes back to the whole, I think, trust is going to be a key word for the future. And we need to define how that is. I'm not sure governments are going to be able to define it. Uh, because by the time they define trust, I think the world has moved on. Uh, because technology happens so fast today that we are pressing against barriers. So I think we, we as companies in technology need to start thinking differently and maybe even drive some setting our, in a way our own rules mm -hmm. uh, much more in, in the new world. And that is a big change from, from what we're used to. So no smart, so you can't talk about smart city without talking about trust. I just want to, in terms of mobility, how do you build that trust? Um, well, first, I think it takes time. You, you, and I also know it, it, it doesn't take time to, to lose your trust. And what I would, given we don't have a ton of time, I'll give you one example of a big initiative we've made that I think is really about building trust. Um, we recently published our first ever safety report uh, in the US, uh, which is effectively a transparency exercise we have done without being asked, frankly, by anyone. Uh, in, in terms of without regulation forcing that. We've worked hand in hand with a number of safety advocates and thought that in a way to advance the industry, improve transportation safety and build trust, that was the right thing to do. And I can tell you it's probably one of the hardest uh, decisions that we got to make as a management board over the past years, uh, but certainly one that uh, I hope will go a long way in, in showing that Uber as a company has changed and that we're finding really hard to win people's trust. A lot of issues to mull over. We'll have to leave it there for the moment. Pierre, Peter, you're staying around. Yeah. Chandra, thank you so much for your time today. Ladies and gentlemen, please. Thank you.